uh, during the conflict. I was wondering if you can maybe speak as to how that connection between Hamas and Hezbollah affected things in the government of Lebanon in terms of Fuad Sinyara as well as the alliance between Michelle Aoun and Hezbollah. I think on, on this front, Hamas, as you know, were extremely careful not to step or meddle into the Lebanese affair. And on this front, I think they can be braced in this because they have learned from the lessons which other Palestinian organization have, uh, have uh, made um, in the past. Palestinians at some stage in the 70s, civil war, and even after that, they were like stepping, intervening, trying to influence politics. On this front, I don't think anyone can accuse uh, Hamas of stepping into or meddling into the Lebanese affair and the kind of uh, visits and contacts they made with everyone in Lebanon, uh, Sunnis, Shias, uh, Christians, I think was a reflection of that they were extremely careful not to intervene. This is really the kind of uh, relationship and I don't think have influenced, far from this, as you know, all Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are Sunnis. And definitely no way, even, you know, whatever happens, whatever they, they stand in politics, they will not take something against the government of Samira or the majority of Sunnis. A month and a half ago, uh, in Iraq, some insurgency groups started using the name uh, Hamas in Iraq. Uh, so, how much do you see of connection between the Palestinian Hamas and this, or is it just the name of it? Um, it's, it's quite a, a good question, because there is an Islamic party in Iraq, led by Tarek al Hashmi. And only, I think, 10 days ago, President Bush have called him to ask him to stay in government because he was like threatening to withdraw his support from the government of Maliki. So at the end of the day, this Islamic party led by al Hashim in Iraq is a brother branch for Hamas in Palestine. And this is really bring to question the kind of relationship the United States have with different Islamic Brotherhood organization. On one hand, Hamas in Palestine is a terrorist organization. On the other hand, we are fully engaged with the Islamic party in Iraq or trying to see the American ambassador by attending meeting with some influential figures in Egypt. This kind of relation. Or recently, the kind of support the State Department is giving to the Islamic Brotherhood in Syria. So it's quite a bit confusing. And at the end of the day, as I mentioned, you know, the Islamic Brotherhood worldwide is one movement. So for the norm, I'm sure it should be one of the branches maybe belong to uh, al Hashimi's Islamic party. You mentioned Islamic movements worldwide. What is their worldwide goal? The Islamic Brotherhood, I mean. What is their goal? Their goal. I'm sure I, I'm not an Islamist to start with, so I won't, I won't step too much. But knowing that, you know, in general, they are a moderate movement. So I, I don't think this is the first time uh, uh, one of their uh, branches managed to get power. As you know, the experience uh, we had in Algeria last time, when they won the election, they were not allowed to govern. But it was only Hamas who managed to win. Uh, but looking at the way they have uh, dealt with Arab governments, for a long time, they have a very strong relationship with the uh, uh, royal family in Jordan. Islamic Brotherhood in Jordan, always they have been allied with King Hussein. So this really reflects how moderate they are. Uh, in Egypt, also they always like try to uh, avoid confrontation with the governments, even in spite of the measures taken against, against them by President Nasser and later on by Sadat, they kept like, you know, functioning in a way, trying to avoid changing their names, but to try to work, work within the law. The only, the only um, exception was uh, the way they were um, functioning in Palestine. And even on this front, they were like extremely uh, clear and serious about not to see 
their military activities or even other activities goes beyond the, the, the border of Gaza and West Bank. So they can also make it clear that we are not like a terror organization or try to influence uh, politics worldwide. That's why I, I haven't really heard or have seen any military training camps, let's say, for Hamas in Lebanon or Syria. So you, uh, you talk about something that has been very emotional, to write a return of the refugee. That's a, an emotional subject. But you think about a little emotional about it. It's, 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 almost, almost, it's understandable. But of course, this has happened all over the world. Can you say that there is a possibility that people can get compensated rather than the right of going back to their home in Jaffa. I'm just, if I wanted to bluntly say, that would be a very emotional thing for the Israelis, that would be a very emotional thing for the Palestinians. I, and we wonder, and it's happened in Hungary, it happened in most of the country. There was always compensation given. Could that be the case? But you can use it as an emotional tool for politics. And I'm just wondering if that is something that you want to discuss. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good point. To start with, it's not something emotional. It's a United Nations Resolution Number 194, which was ad adopted by the United Nations long, long time ago. So it's a United Nations Resolution and I believe, if we want to be fair, as other United Nations resolutions have been negotiated and influenced and enforced, so this one should follow. In terms of, I'm sure, you know, as I mentioned, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to make peace, you have to make concessions. And I'm sure there can be some kind of understanding. It's, I'll give you an example. During the secret talks which have took place here during President Clinton, there was a complete agreement about the return of more than 100,000 Palestinians who lives in Lebanon. President Clinton, when he discussed it with Palestinians, he understood it completely, and he was sympathetic to the extent that he convinced the Israelis at that time in the talks that we should do something about it. And they tried to find some different banners to say it's like, you know, Let's look at it from other angles. We sh shouldn't like name it the right to return, but we would call it like, okay, we just have to help families get together. So I'm sure when there is like this concern, this concern about that we should achieve peace, I'm sure there are so many things at the end of the day. You know, as I mentioned, there are a large number of Palestinians in Lebanon, but I'm sure if you give them the right to return, they will not go to, 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 to live back because either they have migrated, they've got families, or maybe it's, it's far, as far as Sweden or Norway, or as, United States or Chile. So, but it's, it's quite important. If the Israelis, and I know that how sympathetic they get to this, I'm sure if they have feeling, others have feeling too, to solve this problem, we should stop from thinking this way. It's like saying, I really agree with you, I'm sympathetic with you, but let's have it. No. We have to make concessions, and it has to be on both fronts. This is really the point where we need to get so we can put things behind and look for the future. I applaud your willingness to look at this constructively, but we're framing only half of the issue. We're framing only half of the issue when we speak of the, uh, the Palestinian refugees from the creation state of Israel. Uh, and I'm sure you know that probably an equal number of Jews emigrated from Iraq, from Jordan, from Egypt, from Morocco, huge numbers, uh, probably almost exactly parallel with the population of, of Arabs that left Israel from its creation. So what, what should I do with this? It's not my fault. It's not my choice. Well, I should pay a price for it. I started this by saying that I yeah. applaud your willingness to work this constructively. But, but I say frame the issue that the right of return or the right to compensation or some other resolution of this very, very difficult issue must not look just simply at half of the equation, but must look at the entire problem. Of course. Of course there is a need to look at it. But as I mentioned, you know, you mentioned that the, the Jews who were created from Morocco. Nobody has forced them, and I know that. No, no, this is not true. I can tell you a, a very, can, can, I, can I answer? When you got the time, you will ask questions. I can tell you one of my greatest friends in Morocco is Andrew Azulay. He's a Jew. He's an advisor for the king of, uh, of Morocco. And I know I have seen so many Jews going back, living freely, have an influence even in politics in, in, in Morocco. 